Hey, it's T. I'm one of the geniuses at Ask Zyla. So let's just get started with the live session. Okay, so the first question is from grade 12, calculus and vectors questions. It's with lines in 3D. So this question is saying for each of the following pairs of equations, determine whether they represent the same line, parallel lines, or neither of these. So we're going to do 9A for this one. So 9A, I'm just going to rewrite this. We have one line which has a point, 1, 0, 3, and direction vector with the parameter s. So 3, negative 6, and 3. And we have a second line. Let's call this R1 and R2, which has another point, 2, negative 2, 5, and another direction vector with a different parameter, t, so 2, negative 4, 2. Okay. So we're trying to check if they are the same line, if they're parallel lines, or neither of the two. So to check if they're parallel lines, what we should be doing is taking the direction vectors and seeing if they're multiples of each other. So my first check is to see if they're parallel. So I'm going to say 3, negative 6, 3 is equal to some constant k and 2, negative 4, 2. Okay. So what we're going to do with this is see if k is the same for x, y, and z. So is 3 equal to k times 2? Is negative 6 equal to k times negative 4? And is 3 equal to k2 again? Right? The x and y's, x and z's are pretty similar, so k is going to be 3 over 2 for both of these, so that's fine. And then k for this one ends up being negative 6 over negative 4, which simplifies to 3 over 2 as well. Right? So k is con constant for the x, y, z's. That tells me one direction vector is a multiple of the other direction vector. Right? So this means that the two lines are parallel. Right? They're going the same direction. They just have different magnitudes. So next, what we're going to check if they're on the same line. So what, we have two points. We have one point on this one and another point and two direction vectors. What we could do is take one of the points, make it equal to the other line, and see if it lies on the other line. So if 1, 0, 3 lies in the second line, that means they're the exact same line. Right? So how do we do this? We're going to take the first point and make it equal to the second line. Okay. I'm just going to rewrite that, so I have 1, 0, 3 is equal to the line, which is 2, negative 2, 5, plus t, negative 2, 5, t of 2, negative 4, 2. Right. Now what we're checking is to see if the parameter t is the same for the x, y, and z. So I need to come up with an x equation, y equation, and a z equation. Right. So my x equation is 1 is equal to 2 plus 2t. Two my This is my x. Right. My y ends up being 0 is equal to negative 2 plus t times negative 4. Right. This evaluates to just negative 4t. And then my z's, like this, ends up being 3 is equal to 5 plus 2t. Okay, so I'm going to solve for t in each of these equations. So t ends up being, in this case, negative 1 over 1, negative 1 over 2. Right. t ends up being, again, negative 1 over 2 for this. And t ends up being 3 minus 2. Uh, sorry, 3 minus 5, I have negative 2. Negative 2 over 2 ends up being just negative 1. Right? So my parameter t is not the same for the x, y, and z. That tells me that this point does not lie on this line. Right? So I'm going to say that the two lines are parallel, but not the same. Right, just to recap what we did, we're asked to find if the two following equations determine whether they represent the same line, parallel lines, or neither of the, neither of the two. Okay? So what we first did was to check if they were parallel. So we took the direction vectors, made them equal to each other, and checked if there's a constant that can be multiplied to get the other, right? that constant's k. 
So I evaluated each of them for the x, y, z. I found that all of them gave me 3 over 2. That means the two lines are parallel. Right? So to check if they're the exact same line, I'm going to take one point from line 1 and plug it into line 2 to see if it exists in that line as well. If it does, then the lines are the same. If it doesn't, the lines are not the same. So I did that over here. And I checked to see if the parameter t is the same for the x, y, z. It turned out it's not the same. It's t is equal to negative 1 over 2 for the x and y. But for z, it's just negative 1. So the two lines are parallel, but they're not the same. So this question is dealing with linear quadratic equations. So we're asked to discover a plan that the reader could use to determine a linear quadratic system that has a solution at negative 5 and 16. The reader should be able to follow your plan and determine their own system. Your plan should also help the reader to make informed choices so they'll determine any possible system has a solution of negative 5 and 16. Right. So linear quadratic systems, we're just going to talk broadly about this. So negative 5 and 16. Five, we'll call this 16. So this should be my solution to a linear quadratic solution. Right? That means I have a linear system and a quadratic. And so this is the solution to both. Negative 5 and 16. Okay. So we have to find two equations, one for the linear, one for the quadratic, that have 5 and 6 in that um, in that equation. right? both of them should pass the point negative 5 and 16. Right? So one point could be, I'm, I can come up with a linear equation pretty easily, I can say y equals mx plus b. Right? And I can just plug in an x, the, my y and x, which I know to be negative 5 and 16. I'm going to plug in 16, m times negative 5 plus b. Right? So 16 is equal to negative 5m plus b. Right? So we can pick any m value and we can get a b value accordingly, right? So if we pick an m value to be, let's say, for example, 1, right? So we can say 16 is equal to negative 5 times 1 plus b. So my b value ends up being 16 plus 5, which is 21, right? The m value could be anything. It could be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It doesn't matter what the m value is. But as long as we, when we determine an n value, we have to figure out what the b value is. Okay. The next thing we have to do is find a general equation for quadratic. So we have y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. That's the general form for quadratic. So then I'm going to plug in the x and y's. So I have 16 as my y, negative 5 as my x's. So I'm going to plug those in plus b negative 5 plus c and then I'm going to evaluate this to be 25a minus 5b plus c right so now we have to pick points a b and c to figure out a quadratic equation right so if, for example if I pick an a and b value I can use those values to solve and find what the c value is Right? I can't be picking them independently. When I pick an A, I can pick an A and B, but I have to use the A and B to figure out what the C value is. Okay? It's similar to what we did with the linear system, where if we pick an M value, we can't pick a B value. We have to solve for the B value. So this is dealing with the pyramid of... Uh, there's an equation for the pyramid of a parallelogram, which is P is equal to 2B plus 2C. So let's draw a general equation. So this is B, C... Right. B, C. So the perimeter is 2B plus 2C. Determine P when B is equal to 5 centimeters and C is equal to 7 centimeters. So what we're doing is just plugging in the B and C values into my perimeter equation. Right. So my perimeter is equal to 2B plus 2C. So if my B is equal to 5 centimeters, I'm just going to plug that into my B. If my C is 7 centimeters, that's going to end up being my C. So when I substitute those in, I get 2 times 5 
plus 2 times 7. Right. So this ends up being 10 plus 14, so my perimeter ends up being 24 uh, centimeters. Right. Units are important. Okay. So we're going to jump to the next question. Uh, we missed one. So this is dealing with the surface area volume of a sphere. Right. So they're telling us the chocolate ball is a solid sphere with a surface area of 106 centimeters squared. What is the radius and the volume of the ball? So let's write the equation for surface area for the sphere. That ends up being 4 times pi r squared. Right? So they told us what the surface area is, so I'm going to substitute the surface area at 106 is equal to 4 pi r squared. So there's only one variable, which is the radius, so we can find the radius easily by dividing both sides by 4 pi. Right? And then we have radius squared. So my radius squared is equal to 106 over 4 pi. And then I can find the radius by square rooting both sides. So my radius is 106 over 4 pi, which, which roughly gives me 2.9 centimeters. Right. So the radius is approximately 2.9 centimeters. Now, they're asking me for the volume as well, so for the, the equation for the volume of the sphere is 4 over 3 pi r cubed. Right. So I have the radius, so I can just plug it into this equation now. So 4 over 3 times pi times 2.9 cubed, which gives me roughly 102.6 centimeter cubed. The next one, so we're dealing with grade uh, 11 function, so we're dealing with a series question. Right. So series, generally, when we talk about the difference between series and sequences, is sequence is a pattern of numbers, series is a summation of those numbers. Right. So determine the sum of the first seven numbers, first seven terms, of the geometric series in which T5 is equal to 5 and T8 is equal to negative 40. Right. So, I have an equation Tn is equal to a r n minus 1. Right, so we can, let's go ahead and try to find what a is, which is T1, the first term, and r is my common ratio. Right, so what we can do is come up with two equations for the T5 and T8. Right, so for T5, it's equal to a times r, 5 minus 1, which ends up being 4. Right? And for T8 is equal to A times R, 8 minus 1, which ends up being 7. Right? Then I can replace the T5 with the value 5, which, because that's my fifth term. So A, R, 4. T8 is negative 40 is equal to A, R to the power of 7. Right? So I have equation 1 and equation 2 with two unknown variables, so I can do substitution or elimination to figure out one of the variables. Right. So if I divide 2 by 1, I can eliminate one of the variables, which is a. So I can do negative 40 over 5 is equal to a r to the power of 7 over a r to the power of 4. Right. So my a variables get cancelled out. So now I have negative 8 to the power, sorry, negative 8 is equal to r to the power of 3. So if I cube root both sides, I get r is equal to negative 2. Right, so I found the common ratio. I found one of the variables, so how do I find the other? I'm just going to plug r back into one of the equations. So I'm going to pick equation number 1. Right? So 5 is equal to a times negative 2 to the power of 4. So a ends up being 5 over 16. That's my starting term, T1. Right. So I need all this because I need to use the summation equation. So Sn is equal to A times R to the power N minus 1 over R minus 1. Right. I have my A, I have my R, and I know my N because it's my first seven terms. Right. So S7 
ends up being a, which is I found earlier to be 5 over 16. 5 over 16 r is going to be negative 2 to the power of 7 minus 1 divided by r, which is negative 2 minus 1. Right. This ends up being 215 over 16, which roughly gives you 13.43 as your summation. Okay, so we're going to jump to the next question. So in this one, we are asked to determine the area of a parallelogram ABCD determined by the vectors, the vertices A, B, C, and D. Okay, so let's draw a rough diagram. So we have D. Let's call this C. Let's call this B. Okay. Right. So we have all these points, so we're asked to find the area of the parallelogram. So we need to realize that the area of the parallelogram is can can be found by the magnitude of the cross product between the vertices A D and A B. Right. So A B crossed with A D. If we find the cross product of that and the magnitude of that that's the same as saying the area of the parallelogram. Okay, so how do we find these vertices? Let's check first use the vertices to find the vectors AB, right? So that's the vector B, so it's going to be B minus A. So B was negative 2, 7, and 8. A was 2, 1, and 5. Okay, so when I subtract 2, I should get negative 4, 6, and 30. So that's my vertex. So one of my vectors, right? AB. So I need to find the other one, which is AD. So that's D minus A. Right? So D is 4, negative 3, 7. Minus still 2, 1, 5, which is A. Right? When I get that, I should get 2, negative 4, and 2. So that's A, D. Right? So these are my two vectors. So now I have to get the cross product of AB cross with AD. Okay. Okay. So we have the vectors negative 4, 6, and 3 crossed with the vector 2, negative 4, and 2. Right. So we set up the cross product by the second term in the first vector and the second term in the third term in the second vector. Right. So we have 6, 3, negative 4, 6, and negative 4, 2, 2, and back to negative 4. So this is my x value, this is my y value, and this is my z value. So I'm going to do 6 for my x. I have 6 times 2 minus negative 4 minus negative 4 times 3. Right? That should give you 24. And for my y, I should get 3 times 2 minus negative 4 <coughs> times 2. That should give me 14. And for my z, I'm going to do negative 4 times negative 4 minus 6 times 2. That should give me 4. All right, so my class product ends up being 24, 14, and, and 4. All right, this is the class product of AB crossed with AD. All right, I'm not done yet because I need to find the magnitude of this. So how do I find the magnitude? I'm going to just square root 24 squared plus 14 squared plus 4 squared. Mm. Which is roughly 28. Right. So just to recap what we did, we asked to find the area of the parallelogram ABCD. We've only given the vertices, right? 
So we should know that the a of the palindrome could be found by finding the cross product of two vectors, right? So if we get the vectors a b and a d and find the cross product, the magnitude of that cross product should be the same as the a of the palindrome, right? So I found the vectors a b, which is just b minus a, and I found the vector a d, which is d minus a. I found those two vectors and, and I found the cross product between those two, right? So the cross product came out to be 24, 14, and 4. And then when I found the magnitude of that vector, it turned out to be roughly 28. So that's my area for the polygon. OK. So we're going to jump to the next question. So it's a grade 12 advanced functions um, trick question. So it's telling me there's a piston in a lawnmower that moves up and down 30 times in one second. Its total travel from the top position to the bottom position is 10 centimeters. The vertical position, y in centimeters versus time, t in seconds, can be modeled using this kind of total function. So we asked to write an equation to model this motion. Right? So let's extract all the information given to us. Right? So the 30 times in one second, that's going to tell me what the period is. Right? So the period is one second over 30 revolutions. Right? It ends up being one over 30. Right? The amplitude can be taken from its total travel is from top to bottom is 10 centimeters. Right? So my amplitude is 10 centimeters. Right. So, given these two, we can find an equation for the assigned solar function. So, the equation of axis can be found. Let's say the bottom is zero. That means it starts at zero and it goes to ten, comes back down. So, this is ten. Right. So, the equation of axis will end up being the max plus min. divided by 2. Right, so the max is going to be 10, min is going to be 0, divided by 2 is going to be 5. So that's my equation of axis. Right? So why is that important? Because that's telling me what the c value of the sine solar function is. Right? So let's write the general equation for that. a times sine k x minus d plus c. Right? So what do each of these things mean? A is going to be representing my amplitude or the vertical stretch of compression. K is representing the period, right? the inverse of the period. In other words, it's going to tell me the horizontal stretch of compression. D is going to be the phase shift. C is going to be the vertical shift up and down. Right? C is equivalent to the equation of axis. So I found C already. It's 5. So C is equal to 5. Right. The k value is the inverse of the period. So k, sorry, not the inverse of the period. It's going to be the regular period is 2 pi. Right. So we're going to do 2 pi divided by the period, which is 130, 1 over 30. Right. So the k ends up being 60 pi. And phase shift. Right. So if we choose to use the sign, they, they haven't specified if we're starting at the min or max, so let's just assume we're starting at the equation of axis. Right? So if we're starting at the equation of axis, we don't have a phase shift for the sine graph. So we can say my a value is my amplitude, which I found to be 10. Right? So my amplitude, sorry, my amplitude should be min, min plus max over 2. Right, that should be five as well. So my equation of axis and amplitude is five. So I have an a value of five. I have times sine. My k value of sixty pi. I have no d value, so I'm just going to say x. And a c value of five as well. Okay. 
Okay, so this is an example of finding a sine solve function. There's many variations we can we could have done. We could have found the coarse version of this, which is just applying a phase shift to this, right? So they didn't really specify if we're starting at the top or bottom. So we started at the equation of axis, so there's no phase shift. So the general graph is gonna. This is five, right? It's gonna go up and down within one thirtieth of a second. Okay, I'm gonna jump to the next question. So we're gonna jump to the next one, which is a grade 10 map trig question. So we have a tree that is 9.5 meters tall that casts a shadow that is 3.8 meters long. What's the angle of elevation of the sun? So we have a tree that is 9.5 meters tall, cast a shadow that's 3.8 meters long. Right. So what is the angle of elevation? That is this angle that we're trying to find. Right. So in relation to this angle, we have a right angle triangle. We have the opposite side and the adjacent side. Right opposite and adjacent. So from the primary trig ratios, tan, sine, and cos, which one has opposite and adjacent? It's going to be tan, right? Tan theta is equal to opposite over adjacent. So my tan theta, my theta is unknown, I don't know yet, is going to be opposite, which is 9.5, over adjacent, which is 3.8. Right. So to find the theta, I'm going to take the tan inverse of both sides to give me tan inverse of 9.5 over 3.8. So this, I'm going to plug it into my calculator to tell me that the theta is approximately 68.2 degrees. So this is a grade 12 calculus practice question. We're asked to find the local max of this function. So I'm going to rewrite this. So f of x is equal to e to the power x minus e to the power 2x. Right. So to find the local min or max, we have to find the derivative and make the make that equal to zero. Right. So we have to find f prime of x. Right. So we can do that by getting the derivative of e of x. So e of x is a special function because if you differentiate e of x, it will still give you e of x. Right. So you get e of x minus e of to the power of two x. Right. So this we can use the chain rule to give me two e two x. So this is my derivative, right? So then I'm going to make my derived function equal to zero. So I'm going to say ex minus two e to the power two x, right? So then what I can do is factor out one of the ex's. So I have ex one minus two ex, right? And then I can evaluate when is e to the power x equal to zero, and when is this zero is equal to one minus two e to the x is equal to zero. So I can evaluate both of those to give me e x is equal to one over two, and when is e x equal to zero? So e x e to the power x is equal to zero. Never, right? So it can never be equal to zero. So that's not a solution, right? However, e x could be equal to one over two, right? We can figure that out by taking, turning this into logarithmic form. So we can say x is equal to ln of one over two, right? So we can just plug that into the calculator to get what that is. Right, so that's roughly mm -hmm, that's roughly negative zero point six nine. Right, so we found one of the critical points. We can test it if it's a min or max by drawing a interval table. So we can say when is x less than negative zero point six nine, and when is x greater than zero negative zero point six nine. Right. Just plug in values into my derived function. That should give you a plus if it's less than negative 0.69 and a minus 
If it's greater, that means my rate of change is increasing. And for the negative, that means my rate of change is decreasing. Right? That tells me it's going to be a max because I have a function that looks like this. Right? If my rate of change is increasing and then decreasing, that means I have a max. Versus if it was the opposite, it will be decreasing and then increasing, which will give me a min. Right? So this confirms that it's a max. So I have a local max at x is equal to negative 0 0.69. Okay, so that about does it for us today. So once again, if you have any questions, send us a message. We'll be happy to help you out. Um, our next live will be this Wednesday at 8 p.m. as well. So send us your questions to get ready for that. And hope you guys have a good night. Take care.